Good morning. Okay, so first of all, um, choir, that was amazing. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm pretty sure that if you add more to the choir, we're going to start having to dangle them like angels. <laughs> I commented earlier to David that the podium went, and the altar was a little forward, and I didn't know if I'd have enough room to pace back and forth, and then I turned to Chip a few minutes ago, and I go, there was no place to put the altar if we moved it back any, so... My name is Eileen Hicks, and I am blessed to be with you today. I'm part of the pastoral staff. Um, Mother's Day is uh, the day that David uh, normally gives me to preach, and I just very much enjoy it. Um, Mother's Day is a special thing. But Mother's Day, there's a lot of really hard pieces to it. I want you to know that every single time, up until last night, I'm so excited, um, every time I've preached on marriage, um, Chip and I have had the worst fight ever. So then I stand here the next day saying, if you do this, then your marriage will... No, it won't. No, it won't, because it didn't work for me. So then if you talk about children, then, of course, my children lose their minds the day before. Um, of course, it wasn't me that lost my mind. It was them that lost their... I'm just making sure everybody understands. No. <laughs> the honest thing is, is, is whenever you feel like you've put yourself out there to do something or say something, that's the time that it all falls apart. So um, only once yesterday, Alex and I were talking, and I went, nope, we're going different directions right now, because I was sure that was going to be a, a sermon uh, example that I didn't want to have later. So, well, I want you to know that, that when we talk about mothers, um, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to be a mom, because um, in the Bible, it has some really great moms, some really great moms. Um, and there's also um, Proverbs 31. How many people are familiar with Proverbs 31? Mm -hmm. How many women does the Proverbs 31 just make you feel bad? <laughs> For those of you who are not fam familiar with Proverbs 31, let me just help you a little, just a little bit of that. Um, it's, it's called the, a virtuous and a capable wife. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She uh, is like a merchant ship, brings her food from afar, she gets up before dawn and prepares breakfast for the household, plans the day's work for her servants. She goes into expense the field and buys it. She is earning to plant the vineyard. She's energetic, strong, and a hard worker. She makes sure that dealing with the profitable, the lamp burns into the late night. Her hands are busy spinning thread with her fingers twisting fiber. Okay, so she makes her own material. <laughs> Clearly, they didn't know Joanne. Or that she had fabric, but that's okay. Let's leave that there. Uh, let's see. Uh, she extends a helping hand to the poor. She opens her arms for the needy. She has no fear of the winter in her household because of, she makes everyone warm clothes with the, you know, with the flax that she clearly spun with her fingers. Okay. Um, she um, makes her own bedspreads. She dresses in fine linens and purple gowns. Her husband. Okay. 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 So it just makes you feel bad because I want you to know. Then then it goes into you know that her kids and, you know, she dresses beautifully and she does all these things that are wonderful. And it just makes me feel bad. Um, Carrie Beth tried to make me feel better when I talked to her about it. She said they had time and we don't have time. <sighs> Granted, there's still 24 hours in a day then and there's 24 hours in a day now, but that's okay. It's okay. It's not that bad. So then you look at some other moms in the Bible. Okay, you look at um, Jochebed, um, she's Moses' mom, and she does something that I don't know that I could do once, let alone twice. She gives up her child, and both times by giving up her child, she saves his life. First, she puts him in the basket and puts him in the river, praying that God would protect him, believing that God would protect him. Okay, so that's really good. So she's a really good mom. Okay, so that makes me feel bad too. Okay, then we go to um, Hannah, Hannah, the mother of Samuel. Um, if you're not familiar with her, um, she dedicated Samuel to the Lord, and, and God blessed her by making him into his ministry. Okay, okay, so I haven't done that, I haven't done that, I haven't done that. Okay, so I was really, really trying to work on this, and then I figured out somebody that I think we can all feel better about. Mary, Jesus' mom. 
She was picked by God personally, right? Picked her because of how she was made, right? Mm -hmm. She lost Jesus for three days. Now, I lost Alex at John Fabrics, but that's not the point. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't three days. <laughs> it might have felt like it. But um, I lost Alex at Joanne Fabrics. He was a little guy. And um, I was shopping, imagine. And um, the lady at the cutting counter said, I know where Alex is. He's just fine. So I went on with my shopping because she said he was just fine. Right? So then I got my fabric cut. See, I didn't spin it together. No, I just bought fabric. Okay, so I got my fabric, and I said, is Alex playing in the back? She said, oh, no, no, no. She walked over to the, the bolts of fabric, and she pulled the fabric back, and there Alex was asleep on a shelf. <laughs> yeah, I'm a good mom. Good mom. <laughs> But, but Jesus' mom lost him for three days. I lost Alex for a little while. I think all of us have lost our child at one moment or another, on purpose, not on purpose. Not on purpose. No, no it's never on purpose. But she also, if you remember his very first miracle, um, she says to Jesus, they've run out of wine. Do something. Do something. Jesus says, it's not my time. Right? Not my time. Does she say, okay okay. No, she does what every single mother in the world does. Take care of it and do whatever he tells you to do and walks away. Take care of it. So Jesus obviously performs his first miracle. So moms aren't very different now than they were then, for good or for bad. Um, we have a lot more things that we have to deal with, I think, but I can't imagine having to do all the things that the Proverbs 31 woman had to deal with. Um, being a mom is an amazing thing, and I know that there are a lot of people who have moms that are not the best in the world, or their moms have already passed. I know that there are people who are moms, and they're having difficulties with their children or have lost their children. And so there's a lot of, of difficulty in this day as much as there is joy in this day. But um, when you think about it, for those of you who are not moms, every relationship is much the same as a mom relationship. Our relationships are about the fact that, that God loved us and so that we love others, right? It is the love and care that we received from Christ that make our ability to love as the example because he is our example. So when we talk about what it is to love and care for people, it, it sometimes people refer to as a mom thing, but, but I think it's a dad thing. I think it's a relationship thing. I think it's a, I think it's all comes down to love. Everything we have comes down to love. Now, if you look at, I'm going to read from you some of um, 1 Corinthians 13. I, I've done this at many weddings. I love the scripture. It's one of my favorite. But it is not about necessarily about romantic love. It's about love. And love can be a brother and a sister, a mother, can, a mother and a father. It, can be, it does not have to be a romantic love. Um, I'm going to read this from the message just because of the way it's put together in the message. It's a little different. Um, I think the wording kind of catches you more in the message than before. Normally, you hear love is patient, love is kind. That's the NIV version. Um, but this one is with love never gives up. Love cares more for others than self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. It doesn't have a swelled head. It doesn't force itself on others. It isn't always me first. It isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. It doesn't revel when others grovel. It takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. It puts up with everything. Everything. 
unconditional love. It trusts God's always, it always looks for best, it never looks back, but keeps going till the end. Now, I would hope that each of us would use those in any relationship that we have, the unconditional love that we should have for the people who are around us, the grace and forgiveness that we receive from Jesus that therefore we need to give those who are around us. And we don't need to, but it's our love for Jesus that overflows out of us that brings us to a point where that is how we respond to people. Doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, and puts up with anything or everything. But trusting God always. When you think of the things that a relationship needs, the first thing that you think of is communication. How many people can have a relationship with no communication? Okay, I understand. I understand. We pray for her every day. Joshua raised his hand for anybody who didn't see that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Mm-mm. I'm pretty sure you need to over-communicate, sir. But communication is one of those things that's the basis of every relationship you have. If you don't talk about it, if you don't, if you don't compare, if you don't love, if you don't have that time together then the relationship isn't there. Now, I had lunch with somebody this week, and I had not um, spent a lot of time with her in quite some time, and we were sitting at lunch, and, and, and she was sharing what was going on in her life, and some of it was very difficult, but she was sharing what was going on, and I was listening, and she said, she says, it, it almost feels like we haven't been apart. Well, my love language is not time. I can, I can see you today and have a great time and then in another week see you and have a great time. It doesn't make me feel like we don't have a relationship. But it does change who you are because as you grow and change in life, if you don't share that with the people who are around you, then they won't know you when you get back together. Many people have family reunions and, and it's been such a long time that you miss out on things that have happened in people's lives. And you don't have that communication. You don't have that, that coming together of people. Every single piece of the relationship I'm going to talk about today is part of the relationship that you need to have with Jesus Christ. Because if we don't have communication with him, if we don't share our time with him, if we don't pray, if we don't read his word, if we don't listen, it's just like spending time with somebody else. It changes who we are by our ability to communicate. I know that you've played the telephone game before. It's one of my favorites with the kids upstairs because I just get a kick out of it. I'm sure there's a lesson in it, but I just get a kick out of it, so that's what it's about. I want you to know on Easter, I did the telephone game, Jesus is alive. And I want you to know the very last kid at the very end of the room, 50 kids later, knew Jesus was alive. Because they knew what was going to be said. Don't you think? They kind of had an idea. But if you start out with, a hippo has a hula hoop and goes on Tuesday to get ice cream, you'd be amazed at what you end up at the end. (laughs) I thought hippo and hula hoop would get the beginning going and you wouldn't forget that part, but it doesn't help. It doesn't help. But that's what it is. If our communication with somebody that we know and love is very, very the same as every time. How are you? I'm fine. What are you doing? You're fine. How are your kids? That's not an intimate relationship. That's not a conversation where we change who we are and grow closer together. Now, I want you to know that um, David was very nice to a young man a little while ago. Super, super nice to this kid. There was a child who didn't want to come into the sanctuary because God was in here. And, and he was a little afraid about coming in. So David put his mind at ease and had a conversation with him and explained to him that God was everywhere. It was true. It was true. 
But it's the point when we're trying to teach kids is that God is everywhere and he already knows what you think. He's not surprised. But if you don't talk to him, if you don't share time with him, if you don't pray, if you don't listen, then what does it matter if he knows what you think? If you don't care what he thinks about what you think. How do we bring those pieces together? How do we share love? How do we... Um, it's sharing activity, sharing time. It's acceptance. I know that um, there are many people in the room who have trouble with um, acceptance, acceptance of themselves. The Proverbs 31 lady really throws me off, makes me not think I'm doing a really great job, and I have a little trouble with that. But I think that the world spends a whole lot of time telling us we're not very good at anything we do. And so we have to accept who we are. We have to accept our gifts. We have to accept the challenges that are happening in our lives and use, use our ability to talk to God, use the opportunity to share with God that we might be stronger, be more loving, be more accepting, to give grace and love to all those people around us. The real example is, is that our relationship with Christ impacts every other relationship we have in our life. Every relationship is impacted by our ability to receive love and grace from God and then give it to others. It is our commitment to stay in connection with Christ that gives us the opportunity to share with others. I don't think that we always understand how the world is going to change when we spend time with God. Our scripture today that I used that, that we had uh, Mr. Allen read for us, thank you. It, it's from Philippians, and depending on which version you, you use, one of the things that's really interesting is it says, um, it's that he read not to look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And don't look only. But one of them says, think more of what others need than yourself. Which is, I think, what we go back to the one in Corinthians, is to put others in front of us. You should look to others' good. Not, and, and as you deal with one another, think and act the way Jesus did. So when we think and act the way Jesus did in every relationship in our life, because that is the foundation of the relationship in our life, are we moving forward with love, kindness, and grace? I want you to know that I require more grace than most people I know. But I want you to know that I am surrounded by people who have more grace than I can understand. And it is through that grace that we move forward. When you don't do as well as you think you should, it is by the grace and love in others and someone coming around you that encourages you to step forward. I know each of you are connected to somebody that you love, and because of that relationship, you have been changed. But I pray the biggest relationship that you have, the biggest way that you are changed, is because of the relationship you have with Christ. Because of what you get from him, what you're able to give to others. It is how we as Christians should leave, live in the world. I know that we've been doing for one another, and that's an awesome thing that we get to do. But really, isn't that just an overflowing of what God has asked us to do? We wouldn't have to name it, but it's our opportunity to share it. Because that's what we should be doing every single day in the community every single day, in every relationship that we have, every moment that we breathe. I know that uh, I get to work with our children, and that is a blessing to me, and so I'm thankful that I get to do that. But that's one of the things that we try and teach kids, is that you have to do the things that God asks you to do. So he says, the greatest is to love. The greatest is to love. And how do we love each other? We do it by serving, by caring, by loving, by giving grace. Grace in the world. 
John Wesley was, um, is attributed with this quote. They haven't found it in his writing, so they're not sure it's a John Wesley quote, but I like it anyway, so I'm going to use it. It says, do all you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in every place you can, at all times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Isn't that what God is asking us to do? Isn't that the grace that we've been given, the love that we've been given, that we can do all of that into the world? Do all that you can to love all the time, to give all the grace you can. That's what we're doing. And I know that Mother's Day is an exceptional day to be able to say, these are people in your world that have loved you with all they can. Sometimes for better, sometimes for worse, sometimes on a shelf in Joanne Fabrics. But that's not the point. The point is, is that it's because of the love and grace of God that each one of us makes a mistake and gets to move on. Whenever you think about what God has given to you, whenever you think of the relationships that God has given to you, I pray that it is the relationship with Christ that affects every other relationship you have. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to celebrate But Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be together. We thank you for the opportunity to love and to care and to speak directly to you. We thank you that you not only are in our lives, but you can permeate everything that we do and everything that we say. Lord, help us to want you to do more for us. Help us to want you to include you more. Help us to listen to you. Lord, help us to make you our foundation that we might show love and grace in the world. And all God's people said, amen.